Let's turn to the first, fourth chapter book in the Old Testament. That would be what? First, there are three, four chapter books in the Old Testament, and there are three in the New Testament. Ruth is the first of four chapter books in the, fourth chapter books in the uh, Old Testament, and, and Jonah and Malachi would be the other two. Philippians and Colossians and 2 Timothy are the three four chapter books in the New Testament. Book of Ruth is a wonderful little book and we want to look at uh, the book this morning in four, th in four ways. How, how can you be beautiful? Spiritually speaking now, we're not talking about <laughs> uh, physically. Uh, you, we can't do much about, a whole lot about that, can we? Especially when you get, when you get up as old as Brother Birch and I. Of course, no, some of us were never beautiful, as it were. I married a beautiful girl, though. She couldn't come, Lucille. She couldn't come because she has to work Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, so, but, but uh, I wish she could have come. But she's beautiful. Uh, Ruth, Ruth uh, her name means beautiful. Uh, Ruth means beautiful. And I forgot to ask you all. I was uh, standing in the vestibule a while ago, as you all Many of you saw me standing there, and I was just uh, uh, making contact with you, and I was just wondering how many roofs are here in the uh, church this morning. And may I ask, anybody wh whose name is Ruth? No one here today? Ruth means beautiful, or, uh, and she may have been beautiful. She was a Moabite girl, lived in the land, land of Moab, which is uh, in adjacent to, in, uh, to the Dead Sea. And... So let's look at this wonderful book here. Four chapters, uh, just uh, 85 verses. Uh, and of course, there are two books in the Bible named after women. Esther is the other book, which has uh, 10 chapters and 167 verses in it. But this is a little book called Ruth. And uh, we don't know the author of the book. And uh, we, it was written somewhere in the 11th century B.C., it, the story of Ruth is in connection with the book of Judges. If you note verse 1, that it was uh, while the judges were ruling that you had this family situation. And really, the, the book indicates the uh, one side of the book of Judges that you normally don't see. Because uh, here's a family that was with the Lord, although they got out of fellowship with the Lord. But the book of Ruth and this, that story is attached to the time of Judges when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So not, every th not everything is bad, is it? Not everybody is bad, although all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this is a story, this is a bright light in the light of a dark situation during the time of the Judges. If you'll note the last verse of Judges, every man did what, that which was right in his own eyes. And here was a, a family that knew the Lord. The book of Judges. I mean, excuse me, the book of Ruth here. And <clears throat> so and uh, so it can be attached to that book. And some actually back years ago, before the 39 books were divided up into single books, some books were actually merged together. That is considered together like Judges and Ruth because they do relate to each other. The book of the book of Ruth here. Uh, is in contrast to the book of Judges. Judges is the time of darkness. This was the time of light. Uh, judges, time of bondage. This is the time of deliverance. Book of R Judges was uh, indication of unfaithfulness, whereas there's faithfulness seen in this book. In Judges, you have got confusion. In the book of Ruth, you have contentment. In Judges, you have hatred, but you have some love here in the book of, of Ruth. In the book of Judges, you've got disgrace, but in Ruth, you have honor. And you have immorality in the book of Judges, but you've got purity in the book of Ruth. So the two books are very contrastive. We want to use the book of Ruth this morning in four ways. How to be beautiful spiritually. And chapter one uh, is a, a chapter on the decision of faith. Actually, these uh, four chapters, four words. And uh, that'll be a blessing, I hope, to you. How would you like to have, if you had an epitaph on your tombstone, uh, what words would you choose? I remember my father and mother's tombstone. He had put on it because she died, my mother died first. 
he had put inscribed on the tombstone, we shall meet again. And I, I just love to go there and see that. And I hope those two meet, and I hope I can meet them too in heaven as well. I don't know about my mother, but I do, I do believe my father is there this morning. And I know I'm going there through Jesus Christ, my blessed Lord. And so what would you like to have on your tombstone if you did have something inscribed on it? Well, I tell you, you couldn't beat these four words. Uh, if you have a Schofield reference Bible, you really have the four. But I want to look at the four chapters briefly in the time that we have, because we're going to get out by what, 1125? Uh, and, and be going out the doors at 1130 and beating everybody to the restaurants. Right, those of you that eat. That's good, I, I like that too. Everything I see around here, I like. Uh, you could just beat everybody to the restaurants. You don't have to stand in line. Did you all do it that way? Well, that's what you call planning. Uh, you can, you know, you can tell people as to who they are religiously at a, at a cafeteria. Though I don't know if you all have one in Christiansburg. We've got three, three uh, K&Ws in Winston-Salem, on, only uh, two now. The three, if we had four, one, one blew up about 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it blew the thing plumb out of the ground. Uh, and and uh, damaged very much the motel next door. Nobody was fortunately hurt in the thing. But uh, you can tell who's uh, religiously who they are because uh, uh, sermonic type people, denominational type people, they don't hear a sermon at all. It's just a little old 12 minute sermonette. They're at KNW or the eating place by 10 till 12. And then biblical people come in about 12.30. Uh, of course, you all are that way too, but you all, you, you all change that. So most biblical people get in around 12.20, 12.30. And then uh, bus people, they get in 1.30 or between 1.30 and 3 o'clock uh, at, at the eating places. But we're going we're gonna to be there before 12 o'clock today, aren't we? Well, i got to get going then. You all be quiet while I finish this out. In chapter 1 is the decision. Ruth made a decision. I, I'm going to like this, whether you all like it or not. Uh, uh, she made a decision. Now, maybe not necessarily to trust Jehovah as her own, though she did come to know him. And if you know the background, and I'm presuming some things, you'll know that uh, Elimelech and Naomi and Marlon and Killian, uh, father, mother, and two boys, went from Bethlehem of Ephratah down to a little, play, a little country called Moab because of a famine in the land of Bethlehem. Isn't that ironical? Bethlehem means house of bread, and there was a famine there. And they left. They shouldn't have done it, but they did. And they went into a foreign land, Moab, which was a filthy uh, 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 country, to say the least, with all of this gods it had there, which was just filth and nothing but HBO Cinemax filth. And they got out of fellowship. Elimelech means my God is king. Naomi means pleasant. Marlon means uh, sickly. And Killian means wasting away. And, the two, and the, her husband, Elimelech, and two boys died. And uh, she was left, uh, well, the two boys had married um, Ruth and uh, Orpah, respectively. Marlon had married Ruth, and Killian had married Orpah. Uh, and they both died as well as their father, and, and Naomi was left with her two uh, daughters-in-law, daughter-in-laws, and uh, 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 Ruth made a decision to go back with her mother-in-law. You all know the story. This, the decision of faith, she made a decision, and I don't know when she knew the Lord as her own, because she's saved. Ruth was saved. But chapter 1, she made a decision to go back to a strange people with her mother-in-law, Naomi. If you look at verse uh, 14, they lifted up their voice, that is both of the girls, and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but, but Ruth clave unto her. She, she stuck in there. She made a decision to go back with her mother-in-law. And she did, back to Bethlehem. But Orpah didn't go. She went back to her people and to her gods. But Ruth made a decision to go back to a people that she had never seen before with uh, the one that she had loved, her mother-in-law, uh, Naomi. A decision of faith. So she did know the Lord at this time. She made this, this decision to go back. And thus, our life really starts with making a decision for the Lord, doesn't it, really? That's when, I, that's when your life really began. When you trusted Christ. This is so precious to me because the last Sunday of this month, uh, I have a birthday too. 
We uh, commemorate Brother Birch's birthday today, uh, 70, uh, 68 years old, excuse me, 68 years old. And uh, last Sunday of this month, I'll have a spiritual birthday. I was born again last Sunday of October 49. I'm a 49er. And uh, so I don't know what we'll be doing that last Sunday. But I'll tell you one thing. If I'm preaching, I'm going to bring it in. And I'm bringing it in right now. I've been saved 42 years. And I remember the Sunday morning that I was saved. I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps, had just dated a Baptist girl, and had gone to the Baptist church the first time in my Lutheran life. And uh, the one condition for dating her was that I had to go take her to church. And they went to church three times a week, and sometimes every night, which you call revival. And I, we never heard of revival. We never heard of anything uh, in the church I was brought in. And I'm, I'm not kidding much. We never heard of much of anything. And I'm, I was catechized. Some people have been minus sized and other things. And I, I was catechized when I was 12. I mean, excuse me, catechized when I was, um, uh, well, I guess uh, 12 years old. Called the, after catechism classes of the one week, what, which you all call daily vacation Bible school, we call it catechism classes. One week, it ended up on Friday afternoon, confirmed in the church that Sunday morning. And confirmation was that after that, you could go up on the uh, platform and take the Lord's Supper yourself. Teenagers had to wait in the back and watch their parents take the Lord's Supper until they got 12 and confirmed. And we always wanted to get up on the platform and drink some of that juice too. We didn't even know what it meant. Uh, we repeat the Lord's Prayer every Sunday morning of our life. Our Father, it's not the Lord's Prayer, but that's what we call it. Our Father, who art in heaven, monotone ver voice, didn't memorize it. We just said it because the other person on next door said it. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. We didn't know what all that meant. We didn't know what the uh, Lord's Supper meant. We didn't know anything. Now, isn't that pitiful when you don't know anything? And, and I started dating a Baptist girl uh, who actually had prayer uh, uh, on the date and would actually leave the room to uh, finish up the daily, vacation, the daily Bible reading if she didn't finish it. I never, and I never knew anybody like that in my life. Three months later, I was saved. And I've been saved 42 years. Are you saved this morning? Have you made that decision? Ruth made it. I, as I say again, I don't know when she trusted the Lord, but she made a decision here. If you can't help from seeing it if you look at 14 and uh, 16 and following. Ruth said, 16, entreat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me more also if all but death part thee and me. That's what you call making a decision. Have you ever have you made that? I have. Have you made it? I hope you have. And uh, our life really starts with a decision. Can you go back to when you were saved? I tell you when I could, and I'll never get away from it. And, and uh, if I'm, as long as I'm in my right mind, I'll remember 10 to 12 on Sunday morning, the last Sunday of October, 1949, when I, when I saw the light for the first time in my whole life. And then when the pastor gave the invitation, I came down forward and told him I didn't have much background in what I said, but I said, I want to be saved. And I did. I trusted Christ as my Savior, I guess, before I came down front because I was interacting with what he was saying before I started down the aisle. So I don't know. It might have been just a matter of formality to come down the aisle to tell him I wanted to be saved uh, because I was interacting with all that, as I said, before I came. So I knew what I was believing. I knew what I was, who I was trusting. And I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And Ruth made that decision too. And after all, we know she, she, we know she is saved, was saved. Because when you look at Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of your Savior, you find her name in it. And actually, uh, 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 Christ came from that family. From the Ruth, Ruth, and Bo, Ruth Boaz and Obed's family situation. We'll, we'll note that maybe in chapter 4 if we ever get to it. 
Chapter 1 then is the decision of faith. If you're here this morning without the Savior, I hope, I hope you'll trust Christ as your Savior who bore all of your sins in his own body on the tree. That you being dead to sin now as a believer, you can live unto righteousness by whose awful stripe you were healed. 1 Peter 2.24 And verily, verily, I say unto you, repeating Christ's words, he that, he that believeth on me that sent me hath everlasting life and shall never perish but, uh, but, uh, shall never perish, but has passed from death into life. John 5.24 Trust Christ if you don't know him as your Savior. Here's the decision of faith. And here's where their life really begins in making that decision. Look at chapter 2. What is the very next thing in one's life after they trust Christ as Savior or after they make a decision for the, for the Lord? What's the very next thing? Chapter 2. What Chapter 1 of a person's life should be the decision. Chapter 2 of one's life, to make, him, to make him or her beautiful, spiritually speaking, would be service. Right? After the decision comes service. Chapter 2, she serves. They came back home. Well, they didn't. Uh, Naomi came back home and Ruth came with her. And they had been gone. Ruth, uh, Naomi had been gone for about 10 years. And she came back to that little town that's not even on the map. Bethlehem is not even on the map. You could look at a Palestinian map uh, and you'd, you won't find uh, Bethlehem on it. Look, look, for instance, go to Joshua 15 sometime and count the cities in Judah and see if you can find Bethlehem. Well, Micah 5 2 says, uh, uh, Out of thee shall he come forth uh, the least among the ten thousands in Judah. Bethlehem is a small town. Like my town uh, outside of Hickory, North Carolina. If any of you have been to Hickory, a little town called Granite Falls. Uh, that's why I actually went to high school. Well, I came, out, came up out of the country, way out in the country. It took us, it took us hours to get in the town on a, a, a two-horse wagon because we didn't have a car. So I claim Granite Falls, but it's just a small town. It's not on some North Carolina maps. Bethlehem was so small. That's where our Savior was born, as you all know, Micah 5, 2. Because uh, if you look at uh, chapter 1, verse 19, the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to the women, she used to play hopscotch with them when they were growing up. And they said after 10, Is this Naomi? They didn't even know her, really, or they may have, but they, man alive, what has, what has happened to you, woman? Uh, and she said to them, don't call me Naomi. That is pleasant. Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, because the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full with a husband and two boys, but the Lord brought me home again empty. You know, she was out of fellowship. And you know, we could get out of fellowship with the Lord. And the Lord can deal very severely with us. She lost her family. Now, I'm telling you one thing. Uh, it's good to get back in the service of the Lord, isn't it? Some of you all can attest this morning that uh, you trusted Christ as Savior. And I can do the same thing now. And, and uh, later on, we may, have got, we may have strayed somewhat. And the Lord was dealing very bitterly with us. And we got back. And praise the Lord, we came back. We're Brill Cream people. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I came back. In chapter 2, she serves. That's the next thing on the agenda anyway. You know, we, we weren't necessarily saved to serve, were we? Because God has more than one purpose in our salvation. One of which is workmanship, yeah. But that's not the only one. That's not the only one. One, one good reason why God saved us so that he, so that he would have an object of the man, to, uh, to manifest his love upon. Love has to have an object, you know. God so loved the world and he loves us too, his children. So God has more than one purpose, but one of which is service. Because you are my witnesses, Christ said, Acts 1.8. We are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. We are stewards of God, uh, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, and it's required of stewards to be found faithful. So, uh, chapter 2 is the service of our life. And really, that's the correct order, isn't it? That's, biblically, that's the correct order. Salvation, decision for Christ comes first, not works. 
Because it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. It's according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5. For by grace you've been saved through the channel of faith. And that salvation is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But verse 10 of Ephesians is chapter 2. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto a pattern of good works, which before God hath ordained that we walk about in that pattern of good works. So Ephesians 2, 8, we're saved by grace through the channel of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not of works, verse uh, uh, 9, but we are his workmanship. And, we, and, and we've been appointed unto good works, all of us. We've been appointed unto gold, silver, and precious stone type of works, not wood, hay, and stubble. We've been appointed unto good works, not bad works. If we have bad works, it's because we do them. We've been appointed unto good works. So when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, don't blame the Lord for wood, hay, and stubble. Because we've been appointed unto good works. Don't blame God. Blame ourselves. Because we're responsible. What kind of stewards are we? What kind of servant, uh, servant agents are we? What kind of uh, workers are we? Chapter 2 of our life. Ruth served. And after she made a decision, she started serving. Sometimes you can, you can hardly get people to serve. Thank the Lord for this promotional Sunday. That represents attendance, does it? That represented that. But it's hard to get people to serve. I've been a pastor down in Florida. And as Brother Bert said, I'm into pastor now. At a church in Eden, North Carolina. My third time with them. Usually I stay a year. Uh, this, and we came last July. Now this is October. This is the longest I've spent with them. They need a pastor. Pray for Emmanuel Baptist. They've, they've got a prospective man in front of them today. Richard Wright from Statesville, North Carolina. He's not candidating, but they're looking him over. Uh, of course, he, he's big enough to look over, but, uh, but he's a wonderful person. His wife, Linda, is with him. So, chapter 2 of our life is service. Look at chapter 2. Um, Ruth, in verse 2, Ruth the Moabitess, as said to Naomi, let me go into a field and glean for you. Because Naomi was, she, I don't, we don't know her age, because you're not supposed to ask the age of a lady. So nobody asked her, so nobody knows, evidently. But she was too old to do a whole lot of things. Uh, she she. Really, she was too old to have children, really. And I don't know how old that was back then. But she, it was not, it was be hard for her to get out in the field and glean. And Ruth was much younger than she. So therefore, Ruth took it upon herself. And that's a good attitude. You know, it's, it's to go yourself. And she went herself. She was in another person's home. She could have let her worry about the finances. But Ruth took it upon herself to glean. In the fields. Sometimes you just have to prompt people to do something that they're supposed to do anyway. She didn't have to do this. She wanted to clean barley and wheat. And before they could turn it into bread. Barley was not the best bread, but poor people did eat barley. It's used for animals. But people did eat the barley cakes, the barley bread. Wheat was better. And it was actually both harvests going on. If you'll note in chapter 1, verse 22, they came back in the beginning of the harvest. And she served in a, in a part of the field that belonged to Boaz. Um, you'll note in verse 2, 3, she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her chance was to light on the part of the field belonging to Boaz. See, back, the, uh, Boaz owned part of the field, not all of it. He was a rich man, though. But they did. People of Israel, they would uh, divide a field up, you know, as it were. We would have fences uh, as boundary lines maybe. But they would have white stones uh, through on their boundary. So she came to a part of the field that belonged to Boaz. She didn't know what part. She didn't know she was on, on his field, his part. But by chance, no chance really with the Lord, but she just happened to land there. You know, the Lord even works things like that out. Why are you all in Christiansburg? 
Are you here? Are you here just by chance? No, you have, this is where you live. And this is where, uh, in, the, in the plan of God, this is where he, he has you. He, this is where you live. This is your home. And so, wherever we live, that's within the will of God if we're in his will. And uh, she landed on part of the field that belonged to Boaz. She didn't know all that. The Lord worked everything out. But she, it just happened chance with her, uh, as it were. If you note the word hap, H-A-P in verse 3, means chance. Or chance to, to light upon that part of the field, as it were. But even in a, a, a seeming chance, God can lead in the matter, and he did lead. And so she started gleaning. Evidently, if she didn't know this custom, Naomi told her. And that is in our law, in our law, Ruth, uh, you can go through a, a person's field and glean what's left. Uh, Moses laid that out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, quite clearly. The law, the, one of the 613 laws of it, uh, in, in the law of Moses, you know, there's 613 of them. Not just 10 commandments, but 613 of them. One law was that uh, on, in a field, don't cut out the corners. Don't cut out the corners. Leave the corners for the stranger and the poor. Another law was uh, when you glean your crop, don't go back and, pick and, and, and try to p pick up the, uh, the very last thing that you can pick up. Leave that for the poor and the stranger. On your vineyards, when you gr gather your grapes, I could give you scripture for this. When you gather your grapes, make your harvest, but don't go back and pick up uh, the, pick the, the everlasting little old thing that you can find. Leave that for the stranger and the poor. You know, remember in the Gospels, Christ went into the fields and uh, took um, uh, grain in his hand and uh, blew, blew the chaff away and ate it. That was not stealing. That was the law of Moses. Christ lived under the law. And uh, he didn't have a field. He went through someone else's field. That had all, they had already harvested and there were things on the ground. It's very much like any of you men that deer hunt. Uh, even though I've already found my, my deer, she's at home, but if you know, if you deer hunt, of course, I'm talking about the four-legged kind, and I love that, too. Talk to me sometime uh, about that. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm, I need a place to kill me a groundhog up here. If any of you know a place, and I, need, I need to shoot my rifle anyway. So if you've got a groundhog killed, tell me where it is. Uh, underneath the courthouse, anywhere, I can kill it, you know. Just tell me where it is, and, and I can hit with up, with up to 250 yards pretty good because I have a bipod, sandbag, and binoculars, and I'm steady because I was in the Marine Corps. So you don't have to worry about, about it. I could, even, I could shoot between your legs at, at 200 yards and never hit. Uh, never hit. Never hit the groundhog. <laughs> I love to hunt. Fish, I don't, I don't care about fishing. I just go to Mayflower for fish. Uh, what was I saying before y'all interrupted me on that? <clears throat> but the, she uh, was told about this. Uh, and one law said, in the law of Moses, one law said that if you left a, uh, a, a stack of corn or whatever, a bunch of things stacked up, and you forgot to bring it in on the tractor and wagon, don't go back after it. Leave it. Leave it. If you got if you got one, what do you call these things? You, you stack your corn. If you if you got if you left one in the field by mistake, don't go back after it. So she was right in gleaning here. If you'll note, in verse 17, she when she gleaned that day, she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out that which she had gleaned, and it came to be about 27 pounds, about a half a bush of barley grain. Well, that's pretty good, wasn't it? I don't know how much bread that would make. 27 pounds of barley, grain. But uh, she, did, she did pretty well that day. Chapter 2 is service. And she, she did serve. And day after day she did this. It's just not one day now. If you'll note ch chapter 1 verse 22. She started at the beginning of the barley. They came back at the beginning of the barley harvest. Look at chapter 2 verse 23. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean in the, to the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. That was from April through June. She stayed at the job. From April, which was used at the beginning of barley harvest, April, May, June. 
About three months, they, they gleaned, she gleaned, and she stayed in the field of Boaz. That chapter 2 does not say she went into any other field. She stayed there. Was she falling in love with Boaz? I don't know, but he was, he was falling in love with her. And uh, he told her stay. He told her stay in his field. Boaz was not married. And, of course, Ruth had just lost her husband uh, down in uh, uh, Moab. As I told you a while ago, she had married Marlon, who was sickly, and, and, her, and his brother Killian wasting away. Those two boys never did eat their cereal because they just sort of died. You'll have to eat your cereal. Eat a good breakfast. Eat your cereal. If you're going to live, and I eat cereal every morning because it's good. I put honey on mine. Uh, but chapter 2, is this in our lives, service? It was in hers. And biblical should be in ours, shouldn't it? Are you all servants of the Lord? Do you all serve Sunday after Sunday, week after week? I mean, you're doing something spiritually in relation to the church uh, uh, every week of your life. Well, that's the way it ought to be. The way it ought to be. And she stayed from the, be from the beginning to the very end. No, no reneging at all. She was faithful. Faithful. All the way through. As we should be. Because it's required of stewards to be found faithful. So many Christians, they just come on Sunday morning, never come on Sunday night, and they don't come on Wednesday. Uh, uh, I mean, they're not providential hindered. They just don't. I'm talking about those that don't really come at all, and they can come. I know because I've been preaching for 42 years, so I'm not browbeating. I'm just telling the truth. I hope none of you all like that. But there are Christians like that. Just come on Sunday morning, and sometimes not even on Sunday morning. But they're not going to come on Sunday night. And they're not going to come on Wednesday night during the regular services. And they won't come during a revival on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights, whatever. Isn't it pitiful? And they, what do they do during the week? Starts with the N. Most probably nothing. Because if a person is not faithful to the church, you, you can't tell me that you're faithful during the week. If you're not faithful to the local church services. And, uh, of course, that doesn't mean that if you come to church that you do things during the week. We, either. I know that, too. But we, should, we are servants. There are two types of servants, faithful and unfaithful. She was faithful because she did serve. She gleaned those three months. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Chapter 2, chapter 1 is the decision of our lifetime. Chapter 2 is, is the work of faith. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 is she could relax. She could rest. She could, she could actually lie down knowing that everything was, is well with her soul. Relax. She, she did rest. Chapter 2, um, her mother-in-law, Naomi, told her, said, uh, Daughter, shall I not seek rest for you? Now, what she had in mind was a husband where she could actually rest underneath his care is the idea here. Ruth did not know the custom, especially during harvesting days, as to uh, uh, what she should do, because she was a Moabite. The Jewish custom was a little different than what she had been accustomed to, so Naomi had to tell her. Naomi knew that Boaz and Ruth were getting along pretty well by this time. It doesn't take sometimes three months. So, of course, sometimes it takes nine or ten years. My sister dated a, a man for nine years, and they still didn't get married. After nine years of dating, boy, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of shakes and fries, isn't it, in nine years? Or whoppers or whatever you all eat up here. And, that, of course, didn't have pizza back during that time. But that's a lot of shakes and, and uh, fries in nine years, and still didn't get her. But it didn't. 
probably during these three months, they were, they were pretty well looking at each other. And, of course, we know that Boaz loved her. Uh, we get that in chapter 3. He was a little bit older than she. was somewhat older than she. But he fell in love with her. And so the custom in chapter 3 here, they only told her what it is. Said, uh, we don't go back from the threshing floors much at night because it takes, it takes 20 minutes or so to get out every morning to the floors. And then uh, we, we, we actually uh, throw the grain up uh, after the sun goes down anyway when the evening breezes come. And so we work plumb up the way late at night sometimes. As long as the wind's blowing, we can see we, we throw the grain up. So we just don't take time to go home. And we just sleep on the threshing floors. Women on one side, the men on the other. We're there the next morning. And they'll bring food out for us, coffee and donuts or, and whatever, want, whatever they do. And so she said, to, uh, when uh, you watch where Boaz uh, uh, lies down at night on, that, on the men's side, you, you watch where she, he lies, and then uh, you go over and get, lie down at his feet and make sure that you touch his feet so to wake him up. And he'll know, he'll ask who you are, and uh, you don't have to necessarily tell him uh, because, uh, you know, uh, he'll know anyway. And if he spreads his blanket over you, then you can just, you can clap your hands and praise the Lord because he's, a, he's asking you for marriage. If he does that now, if he just turns over and starts snoring again, we'll come back uh, 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 very discouraged because he's, he's not interested. But Boaz, was in, he, he'd, throw the, he'd throw the whole thing over. Anything he had, he'd throw over. Blank and everything else. He loved that girl. And so she did that. If you'll, note, you'll, you'll note in verse um, 5, she said, Naomi, everything you told me, I'll do. And I, and I hope it works out like you, th like you think it is. Well, she said, well, you just do it. You take my word for it. I've been watching you all. And verse 6, she went down to the floor and did according to what her mother-in-law told her. And Boaz, when he had eaten and, and uh, drank and his, uh, uh, iced tea or whatever he had, his heart was merry and he, he, he laid down at the, end of the, at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid down at his feet. Came to pass at midnight, the man was scared to death. Because uh, the, a woman was laying at his feet. Uh, that, 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 was li that, was not, that was a little bit beyond the normal. Of course, he knew what that meant. And of course, uh, what flew in his mind, who in, the world, who in the world is asking for marriage? Of course, he didn't have to ask. All he had to do was smell. Because she had, she had bathed and, and, and sprayed Estee Lauder all over or it might have been Giorgio, I forgot now what, which one it was. But I tell you, she, he, knew what it, he knew who it was. But all he had to do was just open his nostrils, and he knew who was at his feet. And he said, who art thou? He, that's the custom. He, he knew because he had a nose. And she said, well, I'm Ruth. Don't you know, man? Can't you smell? Spread therefore thy blanket over thy handmaid, because you are a near kinsman. You know, these big old, these old liberal fat bellies, who are liberal fat bellies? Uh, those that wear high collars and they don't, they don't exercise much. They eat popcorn a lot and everything at night time and watch HBO and Cinemax. And they, and they get fat around the middle. They got about two or three mountains just hanging out. They think something filthy was going on here. That's all they can think about anyways. That's all, HB, that's all HBO Cinemax people can think about. It's something filthy. This was, this was a custom. And there was no filth uh, underneath the blanket. Because he wasn't even underneath the blanket. He just put, put his blanket over her. It was a custom. Oriental people did that. God used the same figure of speech. Uh, hold your place here. We have a little time. Go with me to Ezekiel 16. Right before Daniel. God used the same custom. Uh, but not physically. He didn't have a blanket thrown over. But he used the idea of the, of the same. Ezekiel 16. And verse 8 and following. Look what God did for Israel. 
Same, under the same figure of speech. 16.8. Now when I pass by thee, talking to Israel, because if you'll note uh, verses 2 and following, you know it's to Israel to whom he's speaking. In verse 8, when I pass by thee, I looked upon thee, and it was a time of love, and I spread my, I spread my blanket over you. I spread my skirt, my blanket over you. And then verse 9, I cleaned you up because you were dirty. I washed thee with water and uh, took away thy blood from thee, anointed with the oil, clothed, clothed thee with broided work. Here's a tabernacle coming up. I clothed you with broided work, shod you with badger skins. I girded thee with fine linen. I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, put bracelets upon thy hands, gave you everything I could give you. I put jewel in your forehead, earrings in your ears, beautiful crown on your head, and thou wast decked with gold, silver, your clothes was of fine linen, silk, embroidered work, and thou didst eat fine flour, honey, and oil. Thou was exceedingly beautiful, and you did prosper into a kingdom. But, verse 15, you went whoring after other nations. You played the harlot with me. Everything I did for you, you became unfaithful to me and went whoring after other nations. But God entered into a relation with his people. And so, same thing here. This is a custom. And she found rest underneath the wings of Boaz. Because she married him. She found rest. Spiritually, after we trusted Christ as our Savior, after we have served the Lord, we can, re we can relax too. You know the happiest people in the world are those that have trusted Christ as Savior and are serving. And then they can, they can, they can have a life of tranquility, uh, peace and serenity about them, inner joy, and can go to sleep at night time and feel relaxed in the Lord. People that serve, if chapter 2 is in our life, then we can lie down at peace with the Lord and have peace in our hearts and our body. But it'll even affect our physical. You know what I mean? Or do you know what I mean? I know what I mean. Do you all know what I mean? People that serve the Lord, they can, they, they've, got, they've got something inside that they, that they don't have to worry, even though they're concerned about their own life and others too. But there's a peace about them. Because they can relax. And you note the order here. Trust. Serve. Then you can, rec you can recline. You can relax. You can rest. Come unto me all you that uh, labor and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight nine. 9. Chapter 4 is what? Then she was rewarded. And that's the last part of our life. You know, at the end of one's life, we're looking forward to the Bema seat, aren't we? Well, she's rewarded here, too. Not, not at the Bema, of course, but I'm just spiritually talking now. And I'm using these four chapters spiritually. You all know how I'm doing it. Chapter 4, she is rewarded. Because she does, she does marry Boaz. Boaz, you know, means strength. Boaz. Oz is the Hebrew word for ox. Oz. Boaz means strength. He was evidently quite, quite physically strong because of his name. Incidentally, Boaz was one of the... Solomon, when he built the temple, he had two big uh, columns on the front porch. One of them was called Boaz, the other one called Jachin. And the Boaz, of course, means strength. Of course, not the other one was, didn't have strength in it either. But Boaz means strength, and one of the columns was named, named after that word. Chapter 4, she's rewarded. At the end of the story, at the end, as it were, to, to her and to us, is our reward. And she's rewarded. You know, Naomi, as I said a while ago, um, her husband and two boys had died, so there was no man-child in the family. And the Jewish custom was that, uh, that the man's name had to be continued in Israel's history to keep the property in the man's name. So she didn't have any men folk uh, to con continue the name of her property in Elimelech's name. So Ruth was admonished by Naomi to marry Boaz, who was a near kinsman. 
He was not the nearest one, but he was near kinsman. The nearest kinsman in chapter 4 backed out of the deal. He wanted to buy the land from Naomi because she had to sell it because to make a living, evidently, or part of the land, at least. But he was wanting to buy the land, but he wouldn't marry Boaz. I mean, marry, excuse me, Ruth. But Boaz said, if you purchase the ground, you also have to marry uh, Ruth and raise up a child in the name of Elimelech. He said, no, I can't do that. We don't know if he was married or not. Of course, if he was married, he couldn't have done this. And that's what, that's what we call leverite marriage. Leverate or leverite, coming from the Latin word lever, which means uh, brother or brother-in-law. So some near kin could purchase a family's property and keep it in the name of the family, or at least he'll go back to the name of that, to that family later on. And, and uh, in the case that person, that, that family situation didn't have a man, fo man person in it, then he could marry... Uh, the girl that had lost her husband in this case here and raise up a child in the name of the, the, of the deceased man. Um, go, hold your place there in four nine. Let me show you the Leverite marriage over in the New Testament. Turn to Matthew 22 real fast. Matthew 22. Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection brought a test case to uh, uh, Christ and it was the matter of this Leverite marriage. Matthew 22, 23, self same day came to him the Sadducees who, didn't, who did not believe in the resurrection. Pharisees did, but the, the Sadducees didn't. They said, teacher, Moses said in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 9, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up a child unto his br dead brother. I'm reading that in. I have the King James. Now there were with us seven brothers. And the first one, when he had married a wife, he died, having no child, issue child. He left his wife to his next brother. Likewise, the second brother died after he had married the girl. And the third one died after he married the girl. And the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, and all the way the seventh one. And the last of all, the woman died. Of course, no wonder. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Everybody just sort of died around in that deal. Uh, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? He said, men, first of all, you don't know the Old Testament scriptures, do you? I, I, I take it that you don't. Secondly, you don't know the power of God because in the resurrection, they don't get married. So that's, 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 that's all. Huh? That's all, folks, right there. That's what he said. I'm not the pig, but turn back to, turn back to Ruth chapter 4 now. She was rewarded. She was rewarded. She made Boaz, and he bought the property. And, he, and they got married and raised up a child. His name was Obed. And Obed was the grandfather of David. Look at, the, look at chapter 4 and verse uh, 14. The woman said to Naomi. The women of Bethlehem said to Naomi. Blessed be Jehovah which has not left you this day without a kinsman. That his name may, may be famous in Israel. He shall be unto thee a restorer of your life. And a nurturer of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, she loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, even though you lost your two boys, hath borne him. And Naomi took Obed and laid it to her bosom and came nurse. And the, women, uh, uh, and the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, and there is a son born to Naomi. He, he, you know, it was a grandchild. And they call his name Obed, O-B-E-D, because he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And down in verse 22, Obed he begat Jesse, the father of David, and Jesse begat David. And Matthew chapter 1 continues the genealogy from verse 22. Isn't that an amazing thing? Turn over to Matthew chapter 1. Look at, look at 422 again. Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. And, and, look, and Matthew in Matthew chapter 1 continues the genealogy uh, right after that. Right after that. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verse um, 5. Salmon, who was a Jewish man, married, um, uh, begat Boaz of Rahab the harlot. Rahab, you know, there's saved at Jericho. Rahab the harlot married a Jewish man and uh, Boaz was born. And, and Boaz begat, uh, through Ruth, begat Obed. And Obed begat Jesse. And that's where we stopped. In, uh, in, in Ruth. And Jesse begat David. Or here's where we stop. The king. And David begat Solomon. And Solomon begat and Rehoboam begat and everybody begat. And look down at verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph. Of whom was born Jesus. 
And so Christ came right straight, smack dab right out of that family in Bethlehem of Ephratah. Our Savior came right out of that family. Oh, Obed beget Jesse. Jesse beget David. Christ is the son of David in that family line. Our Savior. And she was rewarded. And I tell you one thing, folks. If we, if we decide for the Lord, chapter 1 is in our life. Chapter 2 is in our life. Chapter 3 is in our life. Then chapter 4 will be too. But I tell you one thing, if you're here without the Savior, if you don't have chapter 1 in your life, you can never work for the Lord. And Christian, if you've got chapter, since you have chapter 1 in your life, if we don't work for the Lord, we're not going to be able, chapter 3, relax in the Lord, and we're not going to have much reward in chapter 4 of our life at the Bema Seat either. I tell you, these four words are very, very beneficial to us if we'll keep them in the right perspective and carry out it. Last thing, the first one is automatic now. We've already trusted Christ's say. What about chapter 2? Are we serving? If not, then we're not going to have much of chapter 3 in our life where we can relax at night and be happy with the Lord and wake up happy and work during the week happy because we know we're doing what the Lord wants us to do. We're coming to church regularly. We're giving regularly, at, proportionally as the Lord has prospered us the week before. And we're happy about these things, even though we'd like to do more. But we're happy knowing that we're going to have chapter 4 in our life one day when Christ comes, takes us back home, he's going, to, he's going to reward us. But if you're here without the Savior, you don't even have chapter 1 in your life. And you don't know anything about chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, because you're not going to be rewarded if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only believers. Having trusted Christ, then the next three should be logically in that order. We should serve and we can relax in the Lord during our natural life, looking forward to the reward. You all can develop this any way you want to. Let's apply it to our life now. What do you all say? Do I have chapter 1 in my life? Have I trusted Christ as my Savior? And do I really have much of chapter 2 in my life? Let's make the application, folks. You make it to yourself now, because I certainly will, will be wanting to make it to my own life too. Do we really have chapter 2 in our life? What about chapter 3? relaxing in the Lord and be happy, happy. Are you all happy in the Lord? Are you happy? You can't, we can be, can't we? Chapter one is already, is a, is a past thing. Chapter, chapter two is what we should be doing currently. Chapter three is what can presently be, be true of our lives and chapter four is future. Four words, decision, work, relax in the Lord, looking forward to the reward. Father, thank you so much for these four words. Take these four, Father, by means of the Holy Spirit and apply, apply the four words to every heart in the, in the house. Father, to those that don't know Christ as Savior, they don't even have chapter 1. Father, we that do know Christ as Savior, we do have chapter 1 in our life. But, Father, we certainly do are concerned about chapter 2 and the, uh, the uh, logical sequence of that would, the, the, the sequel to that is chapter 3. Chapter 4, Father, of course, is up to the Lord as to when he comes back for us and then we'll be judged for our faithfulness. And so we don't know when that'll be. It could even be shortly, but we don't know. But we're, we're concerned about 2 and 3 of our life right now. 1, we don't have to worry about. 4, we are concerned about our Father. But 2 and 3, where we live, Father, speak to our hearts as believers. 2 and 3 is where we live now. Speak to us, our Father, by means of the Holy Spirit. Make these truths very clear to us. And we'll go outside this building this morning here at 1130 and, and stronger than when we came. And we'll thank you, our Father, in Christ's name. Amen.